Hello and welcome to another D&D Stories. I am your host, T the Writer, and this is the show where I sit here and regale you with all the tabletop gaming stories and remember when something cool happens. So we return once more to the campaign of Ocean Rim, the jewel of the East Coast where 500,000 souls live. And uh, we have seen Mattias the Prowler and his beloved ride off into the sunset, so we must begin following someone else. And now we come at last, you know, 55 episodes in, to probably one of my favorite D&D characters ever, uh, Fudo Padclaw of the Padclaw tribe. He is a an 8th level kobold ranger. Now... Obviously, he does not live in Oshirim. There are forests and fields and, and the, the Twin Sisters River outside of Oshirim, if you looked at the, uh, at the map in the, uh, in the Ocean Rim intro. And uh, there are two sets of forests, the Red Scale Woods and the White Scale Woods. Deep in the Red Scale Woods, uh, outside of Ocean Rim, lives a uh, 700 citizen strong... Uh, tribe of kobold, and of course kobold are the little lizard people that they they dig underground, and they're they're tribal. They're they've got a challenge rating of like one third, so they're nothing. They're they're on the same level of go as goblins. But uh, you know the time would come when kobold would shape the fate of all. So let's talk about our hero, shall we? As I said, 8th level ranger, he had a crocodile uh, as his animal companion. He carried around a crossbow that did frost damage, and he wore eyes of the eagle, which were basically like goggles or sunglasses that let him have a higher spot or a higher search, and it kept him from being dazzled because Kobolds are usually subterranean, so they have great big eyes and great big pupils. So if they go out into sunlight, they are dazzled, they get blinded, they take all kinds of minuses. So he's got these special goggles or special glasses that uh, let him go out during the day to, to hunt or to uh, look for bounties or things like that. Now, Fudo is actually a prince of the tribe, and I know there's usually not a monarchy in a tribe, but shut up, we're, we're mixing words that, that belong to the kobold language and to the common language. So they have a chieftain, and the chieftain has uh, 16 children, and Fudo is number 16, so he is absolutely dead last uh, in the uh, lineup to the throne. So for him to have any authority whatsoever, all of his brothers and sisters would have to die. And in a, in a kobold mound that is 700, you know, it's not freaking likely. So heroes do not often come to the Padclaw tribe, to the, uh, to the Red Scale Woods, because, you know, any group of level one idiots can take on, like, oh, there's a mine... Of, of copper ore that's been taken over by kobolds and you go in there and there's like six kobolds and you let your adventurers like cut their teeth on kobolds so they can level up and see how to play D&D &D or Pathfinder or whatever. No, there are 700 of these little bastards in there and if you attack them they are organized enough to just kick your head in and you know kobold only have between like one and four hit points but uh, Fudo Padclaw of the Padclaw tribe has eight levels in Ranger, so he is more than a match for your stupid level one ass. <laughs> so um, the, the player, his name was Andrew. The player, God, I wish I had like six more people just like him because we really hit it off. He was really into the role play. He, he put on the voices. He did the role playing. He, he was just such a great player. And I'm still in contact with him today. But um, he, God, he, he played such a great part of the Ocean Rim campaign. And it's, it was like Bilbo Baggins picking up the Ring of Power as like the time would come when even the smallest of kobold would shake the fate of the world. And from the humble beginnings of, you know, 16th in line to be chieftain, he rose to be something grand. So, we, uh, we join our hero, Fudo Padclaw of the Padclaw tribe, 
deep in the borough where his father is entertaining diplomats from the south. Now, who exactly do kobolds see that are diplomats? They are lizard folk from across the river to the south. I mean, not like super far equator south. I mean, like they're, they're in the same hundred mile radius of each other. There's a, a, a lizard folk town or a lizard folk village that also does not get bothered by Ocean Rim because there's quite a few lizard folk as well. This, this region is kind of dense when it comes to uh, population and racial diversity. So everybody kind of carved out their own area and, and stare at each other and try not to tip the balance. So in the, uh, in the white scale woods to the south across the river live the lizard folk. And they have crossed the river, which serves as the border, into the red, to, to, into the red scale woods. And uh, they sent a diplomatic contingency to speak directly with the chieftain. Now, obviously, the lizard folk are bigger, stronger, usually come with class levels, better gear. Uh, they, uh, some types of lizard folk have water breathing. They are not dazzled during the daytime, so they can, they can bully the kobold if it ever came to blows. But uh, they, they've sent diplomats, which, which makes a lot of kobold, like, stroke their chins, like, okay... Don't try any funny stuff, because there's like seven or eight of these guys, and there's seven or eight hundred kobold, so uh, they have to play nice while they're there, and they know it. So these, uh, these robed uh, lizard folk with, with staffs and like long swords on their hips and stuff like that come in, and they've got a, a couple of lady lizard folk in there that have the big headdresses, and, and like all the tribal tattoos and, and like the dots on their foreheads and the dots like in weird patterns all over their muzzles and down their down between their breasts and things like that. And they're sitting like at this this long table. Or rather it's a it's a big stone that is rectangular in shape that the kobold didn't bother to move, so they just use it like a conference table. And Fudo is sitting there with his father as the Lizard folk describe to them an offer that they are giving out. Now, the lizard folk, being bigger and stronger, of course claim the river as their own. So all the fish, all the unwary adventurers and their treasures that are rafting down the river, the lizard folk usually pick them off and take all their stuff. And they keep the kobold away because they're smaller and they get dazzled in sunlight, so they're just at a disadvantage. And... The diplomats say that they need a big favor from the kobold, the Padclaw tribe. Excuse us. Excuse us, chieftain. We need a big favor from the Padclaw tribe of the kobold. And in exchange, the lizard folk will back off from the river and give it to the kobold forever. And the chieftain is, is you know, wary but interested, as is Fudo, because this could easily be some kind of trap, some kind of start to a war they know nothing about. But, you know, they sent all these diplomats say, you know, hey, I know you can't go out on the beach because that's where Ocean Rim is, and you can't come to the river because that's where we are, and you can't go inland because that's where all the humans are, and you can't go north to the uh, mountain streams because that's where the dwarves are. We're going to give you this river if you will do but a, but a favor for us. And the chieftain, who's, who's got, like, his, his little medicine man staff is, is sitting there. Fudo's right next to him. You know, Father, we should at least hear them out. He goes, of course, you know, they, they send us diplomats. Of course we will listen, at the very least. The worst we can say is no. And the lizard folk say that they need a tunnel uh, dug under Ocean Rim, uh, under cover of night, to where they will not be seen by... You know, wandering adventurers, farmers, fishermen, uh, the uh, random passerby of sandboxing adventurers. They need it dug under Ocean Rim, like surgical straight, to a certain point where a collapsed cave has something that they want. And if the kobold will dig a tunnel to this cave, they will give them the river. And they will just, like, they'll pack up all their lizard folk stuff and take all their fishing poles and all that stuff and leave forever. And the chieftain goes, what's in this cave that you want so bad? And, and the diplomat goes, that is, that is sacred to the lizard folk and none of your damn business, in so many words. 
And he goes, all you have to do is send your workers to dig this tunnel, and the river is yours. And the chieftain and Fudo kind of lean and, and like mumble back and forth to each other. And, you know, it sounds like a great deal because the river is a fine source of food, fresh water, and, you know, any wary, again, any wary adventurer, blah, 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 down the chain. It would be a great commodity for the Padclaw tribe to have, especially with such a large population. If they got a sudden increase in food stock, well, you know, their population could double in, in 20 years, you know, and they would be bigger, meaner, prosperous. You know, even the dwarves would not come to, to mess with them in their tunnels. And he goes, and the chieftain finally leans back for a bit and he goes, let me confer with some of my advisors and I will, I will get back to you. So a few hours go by, you know, Fudo's kind of sitting there at the conference table, uh, like picking at his teeth with his hooked claws. You know, Fudo is actually pretty decked out for a kobold. Again, he's got the, the crossbow that does frost damage. He's got the eyes of the eagle. I think he had a, uh, a belt of greater dexterity and um, a traveler's cloak and just like all kinds of stuff. When he made his character, you know, I know Fudo can't go into Ocean Rim and go shopping, you know, because he's a kobold. They would shoot him on sight. He's a monster race. So I, I think I gave him like 50,000 gold or 70,000 gold. I was like, you're level eight, go shopping. You know, in fact, take another like free magic item, free of charge. You know, whatever you don't spend will just disappear. So just spend it all as much as you can. And, you know, deck yourself out for, for level eight. Because, you know, you can't go into town. You can't visit a local wizard and, and buy magic items. That's just not something that's going to be available to you. And Andrew kind of understood this. He was like, all right. So he decks himself out and all this cool stuff. And, of course, you know, kobold have no value for money, at least not in this setting. They value shiny objects like like colored glass and, and geodes and, and uh, you know, monocles and, and things that shine in the firelight. You know, I mean, I guess you could argue, like, gold pieces are shiny, but, you know what is gold to somebody that doesn't have an economy, so... <laughs> but, um... And again, this is a tribal society, so they're worried about food, water, shelter, and breeding, and, and not a whole ton else. I guess territory. But, uh, the chieftain comes back a while later, and, um... He says, alright, I will send a group of diggers to the coast under cover of night and they will begin digging this tunnel for you and it should be done within a fortnight or within two weeks. And the lizard folk are very happy with this and you know they they sign like scrolls and documents and stuff like that which is unusual for them and the kobold have no concept of of the written word at least not very much so they kind of put ink on their hands and like slap the paper and <laughs> that's how they sign it. <laughs> um, they're, they're a story driven society so if they have any sort of history it's passed down from kobold to kobold until it passes out of memory. So uh, the lizard folk get up and, and they say you know we'll, we'll be back in, in you know two weeks once this is done if it's done etc etc to confirm that everybody has left the river so it will be safe for kobolds to, to run down there and do their fishing and stuff like that because kobold and lizard folk do not get along. They're, it's almost like a PvP server in World of Warcraft, you know, red is dead, uh, you know, of Horde versus Alliance. It doesn't matter if they're just sitting there fishing, they would run and stab each other. So this diplomatic contingency is, is about the best contact they've had in a few generations. So, the, uh, the lizard folk diplomats, they get up and leave. And Fudo looks over at his father and is like, Father, this is, you know, there's a great risk here, but there's also a great reward. He goes, what do you, what do you have in mind for the security of these diggers? Because, you know, again, we kobold only have like four or five hit points, and one asshole with a longsword could hurt a lot of kobold. Much less, like, if a small adventuring party got wind that there was a tunnel being dug under their city, you know, plus the city guard, plus being out on the beach, out in the open, even even at night, you know, there's moonlight, there's starlight, there's, 
there's the lighthouse, there's so many things that could go wrong. And the chieftain goes, I know, my son, I know, but this river would be a great, a great addition to kobold lands, so I want you to go out there in a few days, once they've had their, their good long start, and uh, make sure that this is going well, that this is going how it's supposed to go. And he goes, yes, father, of course. You know, I am, he's, he's technically a prince. He's like, they will, they will obey the prince, uh, Prince Fudo, if he tells them to leave, if he tells them to, to arm up because somebody's coming, if he tells them to hide. You know, he, he's, stu he's 16th in line to the throne, but, you know, he's still an authority figure. So, um... The, the chieftain sits in thought for a while because this is going to be a big acquisition for them. The whole river across this region. It basically cuts the region in half. And, you know, the forest touches like two-thirds of it. So the humans and the dwarves and all the rest aren't going to come very close because they have a whole like one-third that is like safe for them downstream. So there's some very careful like faction balancing here, you know, don't bother me and I won't bother you and everybody knows it, so. <laughs> um, I think the closest town was Pleasant Grove, so Pleasant Grove's uh, fishermen, freshwater fishermen, will uh, go further downstream to do their fishing and the kobold will be left in peace because the lizard folk will have moved back. And uh, Fudo decides that he needs some help to go with him because he's got his crocodile and he's got his nice like plus two crossbow of frost or whatever it was. It was a pretty nice weapon. But uh, he is at the end of the day a distance character so he needs a tank. He needs somebody to be up in melee if there's more than one or two enemies to, to help take care of him because he doesn't wear heavy armor. He's a kobold. You know he he's only three or four feet tall. He's a kobold and, you know, all of his racials are, are almost all kobold racials are negative. You know, like I said, they, they get dazzled. They have really horrible stat adjustments. They've got the, you know, there's four or five things, if you want to be a kobold, that you have to take subtractions out of. Thusly, the, the belt of greater dexterity and all the magic shit that he's wearing is mostly to bolster his stats and make him not suck. <laughs> but, um... He needs somebody to go with him, and he has the perfect partner. Uh, and her name was uh, Stands with a Fist. Stands with a Fist was another kobold with class levels. She was a 7th level monk. So she had the flurry of blows. She had the awesome abs. She had um, the presence of mind to headbutt, in, headbutt things in the face uh, rather than talk a lot. Um, she was kind of like Fudo's girl next door when they were both tiny, tiny kobold living in the nest, in the nesting area. And, you know, she was like one or two nests over. And, you know, instead of like playing with him or, or like wrestling with all the other little kobolds, she would just like grab you by the shoulders and headbutt you. <laughs> and knock, you, knock your ass out. And uh, she eventually became like a self-taught monk because she wouldn't, use weapons, she would just use her knuckles, and she wouldn't use, like, any kind of armaments or, or crossbows. She would just, like, run up and headbutt things, or run up and kick you in the face, even if you were, like, a tall two legs trying to kill a bunch of kobold that were out hunting or something. She would just, like, leap down from a tree and, like, kick a fucker, and then, like, reach down and snap his neck. And that was just what she did. And all these surprise attacks, you know, over time accumulated XPs for her, and she became seventh level, a seventh level monk. So, not to be trifled with, just one level below Fudo, uh, since, you know, she's an NPC, she shouldn't be, like, up around the same level as him, just as far as po power goes. But that's just one of my preferences. Stands with a Fist was kind of no-nonsense for a while, but there was, like, a childhood affection, sort of a, you know, you, you might get a kiss on the cheek or a hug, if no, just as long as nobody's looking. You know, the, we, are, we are not an item, Fudo. No. No. We are not an item. We are, you, you did a good job. And, you know, that's, that's it, you know. <laughs> so, um, not really girlfriend, but, like, friend who is a girl. 
<laughs> um, so Fudo goes and gets Stance with a fist, and he tells her everything, and she agrees, of course, to come protect the kobold diggers who are going to make all this happen. So the the Padclaw tribe is 700 kobolds strong, and every kobold counts. So the the life of a digger is worth just as much as the life of the chieftain. And if, you know, the, the big strong kobold that have, you know, a level of fighter watch the tunnels, and the kobolds that have eight levels of ranger go out and do the hunting, you know, and the kobold that's got seven levels of monk gotta, gotta come along and protect your stupid ass, well, that's her job then. So the two of them set out, you know, a, a few days go by, so all the digging can get started, and uh, I, I think, like, 15 or 18 kobold... Uh, went to go dig this tunnel. I actually have the map here, and you can find this map um, on the D&D Stories Facebook, so if you actually want to see how this tunnel was laid out and uh, or use it as a dungeon yourself, you absolutely can. You have my permission. Uh, not that I could stop you, but you know what I mean. You have my blessing if you want to use this map yourself. So I've also got it here with me because I forget things, and this is just what I'm going to be using to have for like my notes and stuff, so if I forget something and I pause, it's because I'm looking down at the map trying to figure out what the hell was going on next. Okay, so a uh, few days, five days, seven days go by, and Fudo and Stands with a Fist set out under cover of darkness. Now again, if they go out during the day, they get dazzled, or, or rather, Stands with a Fist would get dazzled, because she doesn't have Eyes of the Eagle like he does. So... I don't think Eyes of the Eagle actually protect you from dazzling, but I just said they did. They're like sunglasses for him. <laughs> but they go out under cover of darkness, and um, they decide they're going to wait, and they, they get all the way to the edge of the forest, and the moon is almost full, so there's a lot of light, plus the guys on top of the walls uh, protecting Ocean Rim, plus the freaking uh, um, lighthouses that are helping the boats come in. They decide they're going to wait for uh, a cloud to roll over the moon. So they, they kind of sit there in silence, uh, like, like picking flecks out of their ears and, and like scratching between their toes and stuff. They, they eat a ration. They just kind of hang out there for a while to wait for shadows to be at their deepest because they have to run across a, uh, a beach that has no cover on it. And they're going to have to run through the surf because then the surf would, uh, or, or the waves, rather, they're going to have to run through the waves. That way the waves of the tide will wash away their footprints. So, you know, they can't leave kobold tracks everywhere. That wouldn't be good. You know, one asshole notices and they're going to send adventuring parties down there to come and kill all the innocent kobold diggers. So once a cloud works its way across, you know, by then uh, Fudo has, has been practicing his hunting. So he actually, with them sitting still, he managed to peg a, uh, a deer and, and get the deer like in his, in his sack or, or like over his shoulder or something like that. He was going to bring it for the, for the diggers to eat uh, once they arrived. And once the cloud passed over the moon that they were waiting for, they uh, picked up their, their deer carcass and, like, ran, like, splashing through the water and made it all the way to the secret entrance of the uh, tunnel that the kobold were digging. And as soon as they emerge into, like, this small little cave room, they realize that there's really no tunnel here. And Fudo looks around like, where is everyone? You know, they're all gone. And stands with a fist, just kind of stroking her chin. She starts touching the wall and stuff. And Fudo does the same. It's like if they were digging under Ocean Room, they would have been digging this way. And his hand passes through the wall. And he eventually, like, he, he leans on it like he's expecting. No, he falls straight through. So only his tail is sticking out. And Stands with a Fist has to pull him by his tail back out into view. And they look at each other and they realize that this is an illusionary cave wall. So the, uh, the lizard folk probably came and drew some like magic runes or something and cast an illusion of a wall. So if somebody came in looking, this would just be like a little, you know, this would be like a little fisherman squatting place. It's, it's maybe 15 by 15 of a room 
and it looks like nobody's been digging here anyway. So they pass through this illusionary wall to go in, and they are immediately met by a kobold sitting at the far end of a hallway with a uh, bell and a hammer. And he raises up his hammer like he's going to hit the bell, and then he sees, oh, it's more kobold. And he goes, Prince Fudo, it's great to see you. And you as well stands with a fist. You know, they're, they're powerful kobold, or they're, they're authority figure kobold. So, of course, he knows them by name. And, you know, this is like the alarm kobold. So if anybody comes in, he gets up and he, he rings the bell so all of the diggers know that somebody's there that not ought to be. And he's got, like, a crossbow next to him and, like, a little candle next to him and some arrows and stuff like that. So he is... The first line of defense, since there's only one way in and one way out, he rings his bell a whole bunch, and then he picks up his crossbow, shoots, and then runs. And that's kind of just his function. And you know, how, you know, how is everyone? He's like, well, the digging is, is going as fast as we can. It's not going to take a fortnight to get there. According to all the, the lizard folk that have been talking, we're, we're almost there now. Uh, as far deep under the city as we're going to go. And Fudo's well like, excellent, excellent work. And they round the corner and they, they decide that they need to just like go check on everybody. So there's, there's an area that's covered with caltrops that they can just kind of pad around because they have small kobold feet. And you know, a few like rudimentary traps have been laid just in case they get attacked. This is just what kobold do when they're digging out a new, like, unsecure area, they leave small traps behind that, you know, somebody will yell in pain, and uh, they'll hear them coming, at least. And they emerge out into this great room that has a great big fire in the middle, and there's a kobold off to one side with a cauldron, like, stir in his cauldron, like, he's, he's gonna be feeding everybody. So Fudo has this great big deer carcass and just kind of throws it in, splashes, he takes a little bit of scalding damage because he threw the whole damn thing in. And, you know, they'll, they'll probably just, like, boil this thing and then tear it apart with their bare hands and bare feet and teeth. You know, there's, there's not a lot of uh, chef stuff going on down here, but he's probably, like, boiling mushrooms and leaves and he's got, like, a gross, a gross gumbo going on. But now they've got deer meat, so that's going to make it way better for everybody because you've got to have some protein if you're going to have muscles to be a digger. And uh, they look around. There's bed rolls everywhere. This is pretty much where everybody goes to sleep. And there's, you know, X number of bed rolls. So they count them. Oh, that's how many diggers there are. Great. And meanwhile, uh, while Fudo and Stands with a Fist are, like, checking supply crates and making sure everybody's got enough food, enough supplies to to be somewhat comfortable while they're doing this, they see that one of the lizard folk who is hanging out in this tunnel is uh, giving Chef some crap. Like, oh, what, what kind of garbage are you making in there, you little piece of shit? And just kind of like giving him guff, giving him like bullying the poor guy. He's just standing there like trying to cook for his buddies. And you know, the rampant racism, the generations and generations of fighting and like stabbing each other and throwing spears across the river at each other. It, it boils over, in, like, in the kitchen area where everybody's supposed to go to sleep. And Fudo, of course, is not having none of this. So he runs over and he, like, kind of pokes this guy, I guess, like, on the ass, because he's that short. He kind of pokes this guy on the ass. Hey, you know, leave him alone. He's just cooking for everybody right now, including you. And, of course, this lizard guy looks down. Oh, what are you going to do about it, you little shit? And so Fudo challenges him to fisticuffs. So he sits down and he gives his crossbow to uh, Stands with a Fist. And uh, the, the lizard folk guy's like, ha, you're half my size. Sure, I'll take you on. And he puts his fists up. And when you're fighting somebody who's half your height, you know, you don't account for a lot of things. So they trade blows back and forth. If Fudo just wants to teach him a lesson, not really kill him or anything like that. And uh, they trade punches back and forth. You know, Fudo's just kind of like punching him in the kneecaps, just like punching him in the thighs, because he can't reach his face. He's twice as tall as him. And, you know, the lizard folk guy really can't like reach other than like the top of his, the top of Fudo's head or anything like that. So they can't hurt each other very much with no weapons. 
Um, but Fudo does eventually gain the upper hand. And uh, the lizard guy starts to uh, pull his scimitar, like he's, he's going to pull his piece and start getting serious, and stands with a fist like who's leaning on the wall, watching the boys measure each other's dicks. Uh, finally unfolds her arms, and she's like, Enough, both of you. We're supposed to be here secretly anyway. We shouldn't be making so much noise. And she kind of like grabs Fudo by his, by his fin, or by his fin ear, and pulls him along like, don't fuck with our chef or I'll punch you in the knees some more. <laughs> and the guy kind of goes off on his own, probably to check the entrance again. There are a couple of lizard folk people, but not nearly so many as there are kobold, because this is a kobold project. And they go further down the tunnel. They find, you know, another fire, another uh, group of kobold that are just kind of digging out another room to uh, to account for more bed rolls. Like if the lizard folk decide to stay here, they need a bigger area with a higher ceiling, since kobold range at about three feet long, uh, about three feet tall, and the lizard folk can be anywhere from four feet to seven feet, depending on the breed. So. They're doing a whole new, uh, a whole new sitting area, and they're journeying further down the tunnel. Like you know, there's there's lots of great progress going on here. They're not digging around anything. They're just going straight on as the crow flies, uh, deep under ocean rim. And Fudo begins to wonder, you know, what could they possibly be digging for that's this far under the city, but it's not part of the sewers. It's not part of the waterways. You know, it's not part of any kind of, like, escape tunnel from some noble's mansion or anything like that. It's it's a pocket of air or something that they know where it is, and they want the kobold to dig there. What could they possibly want that is under this massive city? But he doesn't have long to uh, wonder, because as they're rounding another corner, Fudo and Stands with a Fist hear the alarm bell. And they whirl around and they go, intruders! And so they take off running as fast as they can back to the entrance. And just as suddenly as the alarm bell started, it gets silenced. Like somebody grabbed it rather than uh, uh, dropping it on the ground or anything. They go, oh god, alarm kobold is dead. And they, they dash around the corner just in time to see uh, a small adventuring party and a ranger lowering his longbow. And of course, Fudo looks over, and poor Alarm Kobold has like an arrow sticking out of his forehead or out of his eye, and you can see the blood pooling around him. Poor guy only has four hit points. He didn't stand a chance. And, you know, Fudo and Stands with a Fist, you know, pull their weapons, and they look across at these people. There's like a heavily armored cleric. There's a ranger. There's a fighter. There's a rogue. And I was like, this is a, you know, Fudo, you know, Andrew, whatever. Fudo, you're staring down uh, a standard adventuring party. You know, these guys heard that there were kobold in this cave, and they have come to cut their teeth and make a name for themselves, uh, killing your kind. And, you know, Fudo is furious, because, you know, he's the prince. He's supposed to take care of everybody. And, of course, Stands with a Fist can easily feed off of that anger, you know, she tries to, you know, find her center, but she's a self-taught monk. It doesn't mean she's going to be nice and all Buddhist about this. It means she's going to kick your ass. So I was like, okay, roll initiative. There's four of them and two of you. Good luck. So Fudo, you know, pulls up his plus two crossbow of, of, of Frost, I think it was, and he fires a standard arrow straight into the fighter, and the fighter goes down in one hit. He rolls, like, maximum damage plus the frost damage, plus being, you know, less than 30 feet, plus all these other things, and it stacks the damage, and he goes down in one hit. Like, his breastplate doesn't even stop it. It, you know, frost starts to crawl over his chest, and he just drops. Blah, blood comes out of his mouth. And they're just immediately shocked, and the rogue takes an invisibility potion, and he vanishes from sight, and stands with a fist, kind of goes into a defensive position, like she doesn't want to receive, you know, that kind of backstab from somebody who's invisible. And the cleric immediately goes over to help the fighter, while the ranger and Fudo are, like, trading shots. The ranger's got a longbow, Fudo's got 
the crossbow plus two of frost. And they trade enough arrows that he downs the ranger just as the cleric is trying to heal the fighter. And um, stands with a fist, runs to like just beat on the cleric while, <laughs> while Fudo is shooting into melee. And I think it's like a minus, like a minus four to shoot into melee. But I think Fudo got the feet to where you don't have that, uh, that penalty anymore. So he's a, he's a good shot with his crossbow, this Prince Fudo. But the uh, the rogue is still unaccounted for, and right as Fudo shoots the cleric in the face, like under his shining sun god helm, and he's like, "Oh, they were just cobalt," Blah. going off to one side, stands with a fist, you know, applies her, like her spot check, and you know, being invisible doesn't make you weightless. So if you wander around in a in a tunnel made of dirt, you still leave footprints. So she runs, you know, she basically does like a couple of somersaults and jumps through the air to uh, leap up onto the rogue who is invisible and like crawls all over him, scratching and biting and clawing with her hands and feet. It's like, it's like the end of Lord of the Rings where, where Gollum uh, jumps up on Frodo while he's got the ring and he's invisible. And you just like see her, she like locks her legs around him and like dances back and forth in midair. Fudo can't shoot at it because he can't see a target. And eventually, finally, she finds like his head and she just grabs him and and he drops like a stone. The invisibility potion uh, wearing off with his death. And there's just like blood, blood everywhere and death. And it's like, you guys destroyed them. Like, they didn't take very much damage at all. You guys wrecked these guys. You know, like, the last words out of their mouths were, you know, oh, they were just cobalt. Blah. This might have been, like, a very early adventuring party, just trying to make a name for themselves, picking on the poor kobold that were here digging a tunnel. And, you know, Fudo kind of spits on one of them. And, you know, stands with a fist, cracks her knuckles, and, like, slaps them on the back a couple of times. You know, good job, Fudo. We got him. You know, there was only one casualty. Poor, poor alarm kobold with his bell and his hammer. So they picked it up, and they picked him up uh, bridal style, and they take him back to the rest area. And um, they tell what couple of kobold are there resting. You know, go tell everybody the, the, the alarm is over. You know, we, we killed the intruders. It's like, we need to tell everybody that they know we're here now. Because if Ocean Rim sent, you know, these four assholes down to take care of a kobold problem and they don't come back, you know, after a day or two, that means we're on a time limit. So if this tunnel is almost done and, you know, we've got maybe a day before, you know, those adventurers are going to fail to report back in. They might send stronger adventurers. They might send city guards. They might roll a, a primitive grenade in here and collapse the tunnel with us inside it. So, you know, we're, we're on a time limit. Go send somebody to uh, tell everybody to, you know, pick it up, pick it up. If we want that river, we've got to finish this tunnel and the lizard folk that are here gotta claim whatever it is they're wanting under the city and get out before they get here. So Fudo and Stands with a Fist, you know, they, they tell Chef, Chef, pack it up. You know, if you're gonna make some bag lunches, now's the time. Start cleaning up, you know, grab everything you can. We're going to be uh, we're gonna be getting everybody out of here. So they go further down where they're trying to make a new room. Guys, you know, get out, grab your stuff and go. You know, it's still, it's still night so they can get away uh, under cover of darkness. And they go further down and they get to a point where the tunnel had run into one of Ocean Rim's uh, sewer lines. You know, the great big like Holland Tunnel. You know, there's a sewer level over there. You just don't get to go into it uh, type of thing. And they're, they're siphoning uh, clean water from it to... Uh, keep everybody fed and water and they're like okay no more water seal that up and get out there's gonna be more adventurers coming this way you know the jig is up somebody saw us come in somebody heard you guys digging something happened get out so they they count you know one one two three four five you know there's five more there's you know two or three more they they there's a bunch of diggers here so they they just have to evacuate everybody 
Eventually they go off to on like a side tunnel. It's like, oh, they were digging straight down here because there's a ladder. And they go all the way down. And they go, there's probably like one or two more groups of uh, kobold diggers. And they, um, they've been going around traps as they've been going through. But uh, for some reason at this point... Fudo steps on a kobold trap and, like, falls victim to it, and it was kind of funny. There was a, uh, a crude, like, razor wire trap that the lizard folk had laid down to help the kobold stay safe, and they basically got a net and, like, wove, wove razor wire into it, and it would, like, drop from the ceiling. And I said, okay, Fudo... If you try to escape the net, you're going to take damage. And if you try to uh, stay still, you know, it's going to take this kind of save, etc., etc. So you take this much because it fell on you, and so on and so forth. And stands with a fist is like, okay, don't move. You're, you're going to cut your fucking wrists. And she's like, okay, I, I'm, she's going to do her, her monk acrobatics. So she rolls it, and she runs along the wall to get past where Fudo is trapped under this net, and she can, like, pull the little wench to um, reset the trap, put it back on the ceiling. And they go, razor wire, gosh. Those lizard folk really didn't spare any expense. And they find, like, a crate with a stool, like they had with Alarm Kobold, uh, sitting there, and there's nobody sitting in the stool, but they peek inside the crate. What do they find? Alchemist fire. So they expected somebody to fall into that trap, get trapped in the razor wire net, and then they were just going to pop them with alchemist fire. And they're like, Jesus, that's awful. And they go, what else? Do you, is there anything else in the crate? And I go, yes, there is a death arrow in the crate. And, the, and of course, you know, this piques Fudo's interest. And I go, he goes, really? A death arrow. And I don't remember if death arrows are real or if I pulled them from a different version of D&D or Pathfinder, but death arrows that I use in my games are a plus eights to attack and to damage. So you're basically guaranteed to hit whatever you're shooting at, and it does eight additional damage uh, than normal. So it's as far as like the low end of play, it's going to kill whatever you hit. So, you know, you could kill two kobold lined up next to each other with one arrow. It's black. It's oily. It's, uh, the arrow tip is serrated. The, the, the feathers on the end are silver. They come from, like, these exotic eagles that you, that are, you can't hardly find anymore. They're very expensive to buy. They're, like, 1,700 gold a pop. They are serious ammunition. And the lizard folk left... Uh, left one of these in here that I, God, they they really didn't want anybody to get this far if there's a death arrow in here. And uh, we kind of go to one side and I was like, oh wait, Fudo has a crossbow. And I'm like, it's a death bolt. So I just kind of changed it from an arrow into a bolt. I go, it's a death bolt. So it fits in your crossbow. And of course, you know, Fudo's not going to argue with that. So he he wraps the head of the death bolt and so he doesn't like stab himself and die and he puts it in his bag and uh, he the, he grabs the alchemist fire as well he, he gives one to stands with a fist and um, they they kind of make a mental note of the uh, of the razor wire trap in case they have to run back this way or lead somebody into it because it hasn't been sprung yet but there are more uh, kobold further on in so they find another group of like five kobold that are that are digging out a room uh, deeper on like an inner sanctum kind of thing. But the tunnel keeps going, so they send all those diggers away, and um, they go further in to the tunnel, like you know, way way in, like a hundred yards straight on, and they go. And uh, Fudo and stands with a fist. You know, by then there's no light sources, so their their pupils are expanding way out. And they find uh, dead lizard folk and dead kobold, both like missing limbs, missing like their arms or their legs or their heads, uh, like something massive 
uh, just took fucking giant bites out of them, like a dragon just came along and like took one bite out of each one of these guys and like threw their corpses around in this this darkened hallway and and Fudo kind of squats down to see if he he recognizes any of these guys was like yeah these are these are more kobold diggers and stands with a fist goes to examine the lizard folk to see you know are they missing teeth like did did some hunter come along and take a trophy or or claws or hands like something like a bounty hunter would take no this was some kind of animal that uh, you know, some kind of subterranean animal, and Fudo gets to wondering, you know, did they uh, did they disturb something? And they came across like the lair of something deep, dark that's got giant, giant jaws to to chew them up with. Then so they they instantly go into like stealth mode, like we're gonna sneak from now on. So uh, this hallway becomes a gruesome painting. Of, of bloody walls, organs, and and uh, torn bodies. There's at least, you know, five, six, seven dead lizard folk, and just kobolds scattered everywhere. Like there, there was a battle here, and you know, all they had was pickaxes and and scimitars, and whatever it was destroyed them. So Fudo's kind of like looking around looking around, see is there like a, a tunnel that's been dug by some subterranean monster, you know, stands with a fist, is like unwrapping the the bandages from her hands so that she can do like flurry of blows better and stuff like that with like the calluses on her on her knuckles. And they eventually emerge out into this into this great chamber. And you can kinda tell that they dug through uh like a hardened wall, like these were bricks or or um, uh, cut stones that they busted through, like the side of a dungeon wall or something. But it's one big chamber, and it has like ever burning torches, like here and there. Like they clearly arrived here and set up some lights, and something got them. And again, more lizard folk bodies and more kobold bodies. Like, the diggers made it here, but they sure as hell didn't last long. And they look up, and they see this big, like, Greek-style uh, temple-looking building. Big, big white columns that have, uh, that have hieroglyphs all over them of, like, squids and, and fish and, you know, uh, uh, nautical things like, like whales and... Turning of the tides and swirly symbols that are supposed to be maelstroms. It's some kind of temple. And the doors are already open. So Fudo and Stands with a Fist uh, journey inside. And they find a uh, one of the lizard folk is still alive. And he is leaning over a, sar a stone sarcophagus that is sitting in the middle of this temple. And they go, oh, this isn't a temple. This is a tomb. It was uh, sealed away on purpose, and they came back here to get something. And uh, the lizard folk guy kind of glances up and sees two kobold that are alive. He must have completely forgotten himself uh, if all of his buddies were dead, and he ran inside still to get whatever they were after. He must have completely forgotten himself. And he goes, you know, you two, you know, come and see. We finally, we finally found what we were looking for. And he reaches down into the sarcophagus and he pulls up this big silvery looking staff. And as he holds it out, uh, it shimmers with a strange magical light. And he finally sets it on the ground and it's clearly extended itself by, two or, uh, by a foot or two to uh, be as long as it needs to be for him to hold it properly. So whoever had it before was much smaller than him. And he stands there like, ah, oh, yes, we've got it. Our plans can continue. And then a bullet bursts up out of the floor, this land shark with armor like a tank, and it snaps him up in one bite. Blood and organs go everywhere. And the staff goes clattering to one side. And he's like, ah, chomp. And some people call it a bullet or a bullet or things like that, but I say bullet. It is an armored land shark that is angry and mean and it's gonna eat ya. 
but clearly this was what was biting body parts off of all the poor kobold diggers and off of all of the um off of all the lizard folk biting their heads off and stuff like that. It bursts up through the ground, eats him in one bite. The staff goes to one side, and uh, it clambers up out of the ground, and they can kind of see it's almost insectoid, like there's plates on this thing, like fucking armor. And Fudo gets the strange feeling that his crossbow isn't going to do him very much good against something with armor like that, because you don't shoot at somebody in plate mail with a bow and arrow or a crossbow. It doesn't do you a lot of good, unless you're a good shot and you get it like in their eyes or something. But Fudo is not confident about that, especially after it ate that guy in one bite, and it, it kind of emerges out onto the floor. Its belly is is bulging with, with the body parts and gore of the fucking dozens of guys that it tore through before they got there. And it's, it's beady little yellow eyes kind of kind of peer around for a while. It's used to living in total darkness or digging through tunnels and stuff. And it spots Fudo Padclaw and stands with a fist as the last two like living things that are standing there. And it's going to make a beeline for them for uh, like a giant like climactic boss battle just to just to run them right the fuck over. And that is where we will stop for today. So I hope you enjoyed that story. I hope you enjoy the presence of uh, Fudo Padclaw or Prince Fudo, if you will, and stands with a fist because um, they're in some pretty deep trouble. And to find out if they both make it through or not, you're going to have to tune in next time on D&D Stories. Keep gaming. Hi guys, T here. Remember to hit that like button for me on your way out. If you'd like to see artwork and maps from my gaming table, check out the D&D Stories Facebook page. Also, I have a Patreon if you'd like to toss a few gold pieces into your humble bard's hat. Links in the description below. Keep gaming!